you're seeing a consistency of report from people who are living in very remote areas, who don't have access to Western technology, who are describing the same morphology, the same physical properties of, of the creature. And there's nothing inherently implausible about the, the possibility that these things could exist. With, with Bigfoot, the situation might be different and it's more complex. You're really going to have to get um, such very tangible evidence in order to persuade the government, the federal government, to, to, to section off areas. But yes, if we had something which was of a very high standard, um, it's in all probability the government would have to get involved. In some remote pockets of the world, these, these could still exist in very remote areas. And uh, the question is, because there's such a high level of proof we need, yeah? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So we need that very high level of evidence in order to be independently analyzed and scrutinized by credible scientific bodies. And that's what I'm about. Hey guys, Daniel here in the Vortex, and I'm very honored to be back here with, of course, Bigfoot, but as well, Adam Davis. Adam, it's Hi. an honor to be able to have you back here with us. Good so, to be with you, Daniel. Yeah, you know, it's always great to be able to have you come out to the Texas Bigfoot Conference here in Jefferson, Texas, Bigfoot capital of Texas. But one of the things I think people really get the misconception of, and you talked about this last night in this special presentation you gave, is that we tend to think that we've been everywhere. We've seen it all. We've discovered all these things out in the wilderness areas in the world, but what it could be is that this is a, a we're gravely mistaken in, in this impression we have that we've been everywhere, but there are still places and you've been all over the world exploring some of the most remote, remote places that most people never be able to go to. What are your thoughts on how this idea has kind of shifted our, our perspective and what really could be just so many things we still need to be able to go out and find? Well, I think, I think our understanding of the world and our understanding of science changes as we go. And those two things are interlinked. For example, the Victorians, I remember some of the Victorian scientists, if you look at the history books, say, well, we know all about science. There is very little to know. And clearly they were wrong. In the last 20 years or so, the, the uh, improvements in genetics have been vast. So we know that that isn't the case. Uh, I, I, I also think that, I don't know for a fact, that there are many areas which are still unexplored. And I, can, I know that from my personal experience. Most of the vast mountain ranges of Nepal, the areas in the Congo I've been to, you know I crossed the Kula Swamp. Well, that area is the size of Switzerland, and even the local tribes, the Pygmies and the Bantu, uh, rarely go into anywhere near the interior of that area. We just don't know what's in there. Um, and, you know, I was in India looking for the Mande Barung, that huge primate, or potential huge primate. I spoke to an Indian government official and before I went into that jungle, and I said, what to expect? You know, what, what can I expect? And he said, well, we have no idea what's in 70% of this. So there are areas of the world still which are largely untraversed, where creatures could still exist. And no doubt there are unknown species in many of those areas, taking it aside anything from the oceans. So the idea that there's nothing we need to know, just like the idea that there's nothing we needed to know about science in the Victorian era, is simply not credible. I think it's amazing to see how this does affect many people's general knowledge um, when it comes to just thinking that we've been everywhere and we've seen everything so we don't have any more to learn or discover but like you're saying there's so much still out there and when it comes to Bigfoot in general a lot of people still think very uh, you know closed-minded that not only is this just all nonsense but even if it does exist it's maybe just relegated to the Pacific Northwest but as you and many of the people here are uh, you know finding out but there are these accounts all over the world of something that has the morphology akin to what we call Bigfoot or uh, some kind of feral uh, hairy man or a wild person. What can you speak on to this notion that maybe this isn't an isolated phenomenon, but we're seeing and hearing and getting these reports and accounts from all over the world of something very similar in nature. Could this mean that maybe there are many different types or perhaps at least a few that have existed into the modern era that for whatever reason have just evaded human society altogether? Yeah, I can. And again, I'll give you a specific example. So I mentioned this a little bit last night. But, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or something, I was on the border with Kazakhstan and um, in Mongolia and Kazakhstan. And there was a potential eyewitness for an Almas, which is their equivalent of the Bigfoot. And I said to him, you know, what happened? And this guy was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was the most remote area, very basic. They live in gas, which are felty tents. And he said, well, yeah, I can. I said, you know, what happened was, um, I first thing I heard was this very high-pitched whistling sound 
And then I saw this creature and it was, uh, I'm about six foot, it was about six foot one maybe, or something like that, six foot. And he said it had that conical head and it moved very rapidly. Yeah, very rapidly, even though it seemed like it was walking. And then I was on the, doing the show with Josh Gates, uh, the Expedition Unknown show, and there was a farmer there. And I said, you know, can you tell me what happened? And he said, well, he said, yeah, I can. He said, I was in my higher pastures and he said, and I heard um, a whistling sound. And then I saw this creature, it had a conical head and it moved very rapidly. Now, what is interesting about that is you're seeing a consistency of report from people who are living in very remote areas, who don't have access to Western technology, who are describing the same morphology, the same physical properties of, of the creature. And there's nothing inherently implausible about the, the possibility that these things could exist. You know, you, I mean, you're younger than me, um, but you know, when I was a kid, there was us and there was Neanderthals. That was it, basically. We now know that, that, that and we didn't even think they interbred, yeah? And some of us have got uh, up to 4% Neanderthal DNA. Uh, right. Maybe you've got five, I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm, just we'll see. <laughs> I'm just messing with it. But, but, but we now know that, um, you know, there are, there are at least tw over 20 types of, uh, of humanity or, or ancestors. Um, and so the, I, there's nothing inherently impossible with the notion that in some remote pockets of the world, these, these could still exist in very remote areas. And uh, the question is, because there's such a high level of proof we need, yeah? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So we need that very high level of evidence in order to be independently analyzed and scrutinized by credible scientific bodies. And that's what I'm about. I think so. And that's, as you mentioned, that's sort of the Sagan standard is that extraordinary evidence requires yeah. these, uh, you know, things to be really examined. And so I, I'm fascinated by our potential to make these discoveries. But as we know, it's not really just a discovery. It's sometimes the declaration of these discoveries that has to be brought into public awareness to raise that standard of, of what people really know and consider to be part of reality. So, uh, you know, in our closing thoughts here, what are your considerations on the possibility that whether the United States government or any other government throughout the world comes forward and is one of the first maybe to ever uh, acknowledge that they've made this discovery in a way that supposedly you know helps to bring awareness to the possibility that these creatures these people perhaps are around um, in remote pockets of the world um, or in places and do you find that maybe this would be enacted upon through conservation or any types of uh, preservation efforts um, and what role that might play for us um, by way of anthropology and, and lending ability to go in and, and try to investigate and do field research in a non-invasive way. Do you think that maybe a government coming forward is something that can inv uh, inevitably happen or is eventually something that we may be looking forward to? Well, I hope so. I mean, certainly I, that was my, my view with the Orang Pandak. You know, um, I think I always felt that if we had a very clear crystal clear photograph of the Orang Pandak, that would move the Indonesian government forward to uh, do preservation and conservation in that area. And I was very keen to do that. I mean, I've been to Sumatra eight times, not least because I love the rainforest there and I don't want more palm oil plantations. I want rainforest, I want that legacy. Um, but you have to make sure the local people are involved because it's very arrogant to say, let me tell you what to do, yeah? No, is the response. So right. I want them to be invested in that. Um, in, with, with Bigfoot, the situation might be different and it's more complex. You're really gonna have to get um, such very tangible evidence in order to persuade the government, the federal government, to, to, to section off areas. But yes, if we had something which was of a very high standard, um, it's in all probability the government would have to get involved. Well, I hope so. And it's something that I think many of us are looking forward to. And to anyone who's really interested in keeping up with the work you have going on, you also have The Fold Mysteries, which is a new uh, project you've announced here recently. How can people find out about what you have coming up? Well, I, I, I have the four mysteries, as you know. I have an Adam Davis public Facebook page and I have an Adam Davis Explorer website. So I have all of those things. Obviously, it's not if I have something tangible scientifically, it doesn't whack, it, it doesn't whack itself on Facebook. That's the, not the way to go. <laughs> right. But, you know, on a day to day basis, if people can, if people want to follow up what I'm up to, then they can find me there. Sounds good. Well, Adam, it's been an honor to have you again. Thanks right, so man. much for being here and we'll see you guys and Bigfoot. <laughs> and the Vortex. Yeah, and Bigfoot. If you liked this video, be sure to check out our other content and get connected on our page and social media sites. 
Every day, new discoveries are being made all across the world and beyond. So let's work together to find out what's next. And remember, we won't know if we don't go. I'll see you in the Vortex.